Nigel, are you gonna tell him what you read this month? You gonna tell him what you read? Or not. Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess, this is Nigel, and uh, I forgot. <laughs> Okay, so today I want to talk about the latest nonfiction books that I've read. Did you read any nonfiction books? Do you need to tell them about a nonfiction book you read? That's what I thought. You've only read fiction. Please. The last nonfiction books that I've read over the last couple of months. Hey, no, no. And my, ow, ow. <laughs> my April wrap up will be separate. If I can get through this wrap up. A little snaggle tooth. Hey, snaggles. Okay, so we're going back to February where I read Between the World and Me by Tana Hasi Coates. I feel like I've spoken, I feel like I've talked about this, but I don't remember. Anyway, Between the World and Me by Tana Hasi Coates is a short novella. Is it considered a novella? But essentially, it talks about being black in America, specifically being a black man in America. And he writes this story to his son um, growing up as a black man in America. And so it talks about his experiences as he was young and ways that he sees similarities in how his son is growing up and also differences, because obviously there has been some progress, but some things are still the same. He talks about his worries, but also his hopes for his son. It, the, I listened to the, the audiobook, which was narrated by him, and it was so good, but so moving because you can just really tell the emotion and the worry that he has for his son. And it talks about what he wants to see, but what is the reality? What things he has to teach his son to do so that he, hopefully he doesn't, you know, end up dead at a young age. It is heartbreaking, but it's also short. So it's definitely worth the read and definitely worth a listen via audiobook. Um, I can't say much more about it without telling you about the whole thing, but prepare tissues. Nigel, hey, come here. You want a treat? Ah, nope, please. <gasps> Are you okay? You gotta stop jumping like that. Are you okay? Oh Lord. Are you all right? See? Why are you acting like that? Sit down. Thank you. Another I finished in February was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I've mentioned this before. I don't think I'm about to talk the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander was actually written 10 years ago, but this edition, there is a like a foreword that Michelle added in, or was it at the end? I feel like there was a foreword added in by her reflecting on what she wrote 10 years ago and how it resonates now, which not much has changed. It's still very relevant, but essentially the framework of the book is talking about in our current system that mass incarceration has kind of taken the place of Jim Crow laws. So essentially in America for black people, we went from being slaves. And then once we were freed from that, of course they made Jim Crow laws to still, you know, keep us oppressed. And then even though the Jim Crow era has passed, now the system has mass incarceration. She talks about just like, she even gives statistics and numbers on how many prisons we had, like, I don't know, the 1970s versus how many we have now, how it wasn't like predicted to be this way, I think she was talking about, um, but just how it has become so profitable and how many prisons we have, talking about obviously the disproportion of black and brown people, especially men in prisons versus other people, the um, occurrence of how different sentencing is handed out for black and brown people versus white people for the same crimes and black children, how they are sentenced harsher than you know white children. Crimes like weed, um, someone may get a six months probation versus five years in prison. And just, it, she talks about all of these different things that disproportionately affect black and brown people in America and how that is another form of slavery and oppression. And because it's important when you're talking about mass incarceration, the really the, um, she talks about like the whole industrial complex and, and kind of the pipeline and how some areas and school systems, and it's just like setting up black 
people, black men, uh, to always be in the system. If they get caught up in it young, it's really hard for them to escape that as they get older for various reasons and talking about things like pro probation. And I think I'm maybe I've listened and read so many things, so I don't know if I'm mixing it up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that she talks about being on probation and how they have to pay to be on probation. I'm pretty sure like, and if you have an ankle monitor and just all these different things, all these requirements that they require after you get out of jail and in most times they're not helping you and so you're more likely to become a repeat offender and it's just a vicious cycle so she goes into all of that it is very interesting and well argued and obviously something I already knew but just all of the background and context and examples that she provides just makes it like holy shit this is this is ridiculous I'm like I need to just buy these nonfiction books up front because almost all of them that I have listened to, I've ended up really enjoying and wanting to have a physical copy. And I wish that I had it while listening to it so I can make notes and tab so I could have an easy reference point to go back to. But for these, I'll just have to go back into them, but there's just like so much information in it and it was well written. So it was like really easy to listen to. Mm easy to listen to and how it was written not in the information that it talks about and it's like there are so many people and this is something she does cover talking about the comparison of people that are in for non-violent crimes versus violent crimes but it definitely is just a great book to read to start thinking about um think changes that we need to make and so you should read it i read mediocre the dangerous legacy of white male america by ijoma alua ijoma Oluo. I hope I'm saying that correctly. So I'd seen this one floating around and I mean, can you sit down please? Did you like this book as well? Yes, you did. Okay, sit down. Sit. Thank you. Okay. So the title kind of says it all. She talks about the dangerous, the dangerous legacy of white male America. So she talks, she goes back, like, I can't remember how early she starts, but it's like back in the day of like Buffalo Bill and just talks about various white men through America who have been mediocre. And just how this affects all of us, not even just non-white people, but also white women or other white men who are actually successful, how it affects all of us in America by the constant praise and success of mediocre white men. I know, it makes you upset, doesn't it? We don't like the mediocres. Mm -mm. So obviously she, after the election, I know. What do you wanna talk about? Do you have something to share? He's gonna wait till I start talking and then he's gonna say something. What do you have to share? What do you wanna say? Essentially, this is like a survey of the... <laughs> Nigel! Can you wait? Okay. Essentially this book. Okay, hold please while I go feed the baby. So this book essentially is a survey, I think over the last century of mediocrity of white men in America, how America has really celebrated that and elevated that and how dangerous that has become. It starts, oh, stay, stay in place. Wait, sit down. Why every time I'm specifically talking about white men, you show up? I won't call you mediocre though, but you need to get out my camera with, with that. So she starts back as far as like Buffalo Bill, which I've heard of, you know, just in passing. And I hadn't realized who he was, how he got his name by killing over so many American, 
killing so many American bison, which were very important and essential to indigenous people. And they drove them almost to the brink of extinction. And then he had like a, like a Wild West show that went on tour. And so he was for the time kind of, um, ahead of the game or ahead of progression i guess because he did have some like women in his show and i don't know if he had some like indigenous people in his show but still wasn't paying them enough and you know still did harmful things basically the the book is chronicling the last century of america with mike white men who may have done some good things but not so much as they were like some extraordinary extraordinary they just did enough for their benefit to make them look better and to keep their place of power and so she starts back in like the 1800s with that but comes forward obviously is going to talk about donald trump but also people like joe biden and bernie sanders she explained it finally and i can't even explain it well enough so you need to read the book because there was this weird thing during the election time where people wanted bernie to be the nominee and then if bernie wasn't going to be the nominee and then once it was determined he wasn't going to be the nominee so many of those people went over to Trump and I was so confused at that logic, Joe Rogan, but she explains it well on how they only, and it's not to say that Bernie Sanders is like the most terrible person, but this whole notion of white mediocrity is like doing just enough to seem progressive or to make yourself look like you care about marginalized people when really the first thing in your mind is still for you and your whiteness to be center and to be comfortable. And so you really need that part. Like I remember I remember like replaying that part when she was explaining how the Bernie bros went over to be Trumpies and it was really well explained. I am not doing a great job at explaining this book and so I suggest you read it. The book is narrated by uh, her so it was a great listen and as LeVar Burton says don't take my word for it. Then I read Fearing the Black Body The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. I heard about this book from Mara at Books Like Whoa. And so I personally have been trying to consume more things, books, media, so like podcasts, following different people on Instagram who are trying to um, dismantle kind of the societal standards for beauty and uh, people who are working towards fat liberation. So I'm trying to relearn a lot of things and teach myself different things and so this was a book that was recommended by both Mara and a therapist that I follow on Instagram. So this book is basically arguing that fat phobia started as racism against black people. So I will say that I listened to this on audio and I really wish I had the physical for this one because she references a lot of like photos and art and while she does a great job describing them I really wish I could have like looked at the images and another thing is when she's talking about art and stuff like I'm not an art person, art history kind of person, some of the things, because it goes really far back, I re-listened to and was kind of confused and I wish that I had the physical to like read that passage. So I do want to get a physical copy and go back because I think I didn't absorb everything I could have from it and definitely want to do like a full reread with the audio and the physical. But essentially she's arguing, like going back to like, I don't even know, 1400s, like way back in European time, um, like before they started slavery and how like Europeans, and she talks specifically a lot about like art and how bodies were looked at. And then when slaves were starting to be introduced into Europe and how black women were looked down upon because of their different body structure and features and how that translated into fat phobia because they tended to be uh, rounder or more curvaceous um, than white women in Europe at that time. And it goes through so much where, where again, I don't feel like I got everything out of it that I wanted to and I don't feel like I can explain it well but it, it is a great argument she just talks about different examples of of people through time um, famous figures and women and how those ideas started so long ago and slowly morphed into fat phobia against all people and she brings it into like the present 
isn't to the present day. I think to like the early 90s brings it. And I think that was another thing that I didn't know it was gonna stop at the 90s, but it's something I need to reread for sure because I don't feel like I can talk enough about it here, but it definitely is something if you are interested in um, a theory, an argument on kind of the origins of fat phobia and how how long ago that started and how that is affecting our society now and also how that is rooted in racism and, and anti-blackness, I think this is a great book. And so usually I would say the audio and I think the audio is great, but I also think you could benefit from getting the physical of this book and doing a hybrid read of it. So that wasn't a really great review because I think some of it went over my head, but I'm gonna get back to it. And when I reread it, then I wanna come back and review it again because I'll have more concrete things to say. But I think Mara has talked about, I know Mara has talked about this. I don't know what exactly what video, if I can find the video, I'll link it in the cards and down below because she, definitely can give you a better like a review of it but i still think if you're interested in those uh concepts those theories that it's worth checking out but then i read ace what asexuality reveals about desire society and the meaning of sex by angela chen i heard ashley from bookish rom talk about this i think mara also talked about it and i feel like i may have saw it on instagram from someone else i before reading this and i will say still now didn't know much about asexuality i mean i know a lot more than i did but i'm by no means an expert I have heard of it and really just, you know, threw it in the back of my mind as a term. I will admit and say, like, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how can you be asexual? Like, I've been that person. And so I, I kept seeing it and I was like, okay, it sounds like something I need to read. Again, I listened to the audio. And I will admit that at first, I wanted to DNF it because I was not understanding. I was getting really defensive and it was making me uncomfortable because I was like, I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense. And I was like, I don't wanna to listen to this. And I realized in getting uh, uncomfortable and getting upset at listening to the audio that this I needed to finish it for that reason. Not like every time you don't like a book, you should finish it and not DNF it. Like, you know, I love DNFing, it's self care. But for this one, just because right off the bat, I wasn't like, oh yeah, I know what this is talking about because I've listened to so many things, um, books about like race and racism, which I obviously have lived and experienced and so I'm familiar with. And all those, although those things are uncomfortable, I still am familiar with them. I was not familiar with this at all and so it made me uncomfortable and I was like, this is why I need to finish it. So I kept listening and I feel like I learned a lot from this. Another one that I want to buy and go back to. Um, and I think one of the biggest things, because this doesn't just talk about asexuality, it talks about like pansexuality, demisexuality, the different sexualities, different uh, different people and different sex drives and, and queer people and, and people that are trans and people who are cisgender. And it talks just about all the different people and you can be ace and be this, 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 and this, and it doesn't, there's not one way to be ace, essentially. There's not one way to be asexual. And in one part, she was talking about all these different things, and I was like, wait, well, how is asexuality different from demisexuality, and how's this different from this? And talking about queer platonic relationships, I think that's what it was, call, was called, and there were a lot of like anecdotes from different people who were ace that she shared in the story that I thought were really important because they all had such different lives. Like there was one, there was a trans woman who was asexual. And one of the quotes from her was like, I want, I want people to like, because she loved like dressing up and like really sexy and things like that. And it was like, yeah, I want people to want to fuck me but I don't want to fuck them like I want them to look at me and be like attracted to me but that doesn't mean I want to have sex with you and I was like that makes sense like that totally makes sense and I I don't know in a moment that that clicked in my mind because before I just was like not understanding how it someone's mind worked like that and like <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. And then someone else, they were in a relationship with a man, they were a woman, but then they also had like this 
other serious relationship with a woman, but it wasn't sexual, but it was more, they wanted to be more than like we're besties. And so it was almost like a relationship, but there was no sexual element. And I think that's what she was calling a queer platonic relationship. And essentially she was saying that it's, you know, there's just more language and we need more language to describe these different types of relationships we have instead of, instead of being, ex hello. Did you have fun? You smell like outside. Ah, oh, damn it. Anyway, I think what she was saying was having more terminology to define terminology, terminology to define all these different levels and types of relationships that people have or can have or want to have instead of limiting it to fit into these small things that we have accepted as a society. Again, I don't know if I'm explaining these things well, that's why you need to read the book, but it, it it just opened up so much in my mind. And essentially it's to like, what does it matter what people are describing their relationships? You know, like let them have those different terms and let people have different relationships instead of only having married or dating or best friends. Like relationships can be way more complex and messy. And another part that I really loved that she talked about in this book was uh, especially in America, health insurance and how that's only tied to, you know, like marriage and people who maybe are asexual and maybe just want to have partners or they don't want to be in a re relationship because she also talked about aromantic people um, and how that works against them. Because if you don't want to be in a marriage or something, but you like have a partner or somebody you want to take care of, even if that's a parent and you're not allowed to like share your health care with him, I never thought about it like that, that it's really just tied to marriage and how fucked up that is. So there was so much just beyond asexuality that was discussed in this book. And I think everyone needs to read it. I definitely need to seek out more about um, asexuality. And again, something I will be buying and rereading, but you need to read it. And lastly, most recently, I finished What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat by Aubrey Gordon. And so on the internet, she goes by your fat friend, like she writes um, for Huffington Post, I believe. And she also has a podcast called Maintenance Phase. And I recently started listening to it and it's awesome and hilarious. The podcast is amazing. They started last year and they go through different like aspects of the wellness, fitness, health industry and like really talk about it, debunk stuff, and it's well worth a listen. So, and what we don't talk about when we talk about fat is essentially it's part memoir and part not memoir. I can't, I can't think about, I didn't think what to call it. So Aubrey is a fat woman, uh, also queer. And so she's talking about her experiences, but also with history and trends um, and like societal standards and things around weight. And so some of her stories, I'm sorry, I think they're mowing the lawn. Some of her stories, I literally was like, jaw on the floor talking about her experience like flying um an experience in a grocery store where some lady took like a cantaloupe out of her cart and told her it had too much sugar just wild experiences and i wanted to be like that didn't happen and then i was like you know what people ain't shit so it did happen and it's fucking atrocious i want to make a note that i was lis listening to this book and also started listening to her podcast so maybe i may be overlapping stuff that was talked about in the podcast and the book but talking about how it always is comes from other people who are not fat people judging them that it's always i care about your health i'm worried about your health you can't be the healthy at that size and i'm not gonna lie i was i have been that person in my mind never to someone's face never online in my mind i have thought that and there's been popular tv shows that i have watched like the biggest loser and things like that because it's always about your health i care about your health and what she talks about in the book is like, even if that's really what you cared about, it's like, it's not your business. Like there are people who are bigger for various reasons, whether they like being bigger or they are, maybe they're just more muscular or they take certain medications that make them bigger or they suffer from a disability and so they can't work out or they're on a limited income. Like all of these different things that go into why someone might be fat. And um, so why we, so it's not okay just to say, I'm worried about your health 
and always equate it to someone being lazy because there can be so many reasons. And there are fat people who are healthy. Like she was like, you know, I'm quick to tell people that my cholesterol levels are great and my blood pressure is great and I don't have diabetes. Like all these things we associate with people being fat. Um, she also talks about like terminology, like reclaiming the word fat, like they would just most would be preferred to be called fat. Words like overweight or obese are very like clinical and very harmful because overweight essentially deem or says that there's an exact weight that you should be. And she also covers, which I think was also in Fearing the Black Body, uh, BMI and how that originated is not a medical form. It wasn't created by a doctor and how that has been used um, and then also changed i think she said around 1998 because the bmi has the categories like underweight normal weight overweight obese whatever and the categories shifted and made the numbers like smaller so that if you were say you were 150 pounds but you were a normal bmi they shifted it to where all of a sudden you were now overweight so where the numbers jumped at this certain time where they're like oh my god america's overweight everyone's obese it really was them and their calculations it was like every it's like millions of people in america didn't just all of a sudden gain all these thousands of pounds is that they shifted these numbers and it also is used in how people are insured for health insurance probably life insurance as well i don't know if she said that and of course used against them and of course she's talked about experiences with going to the doctor and how it they have legitimate concerns and pains and issues and how it's often over, overlooked because the first thing is well you need to lose weight and people can have a range of different problems where sometimes sure could that be um, related to that yes but they don't take the time and go through all the questions and all these different scenarios like they would with a person that wasn't as big and that's fucked up and has led people to be um, misdiagnosed or not diagnosed with things for years and led to you know deaths probably pre pre premature deaths there's so much um, it's, there, I say there's so much, but it is relatively short. I'm looking at it on Goodreads. It only says 216 pages. And I feel like that I was like, oh my God, that's it. Like I wanted it to keep going, but I'm listening to the podcast. So I don't want to give all of the stuff away that was in it. But I think again, if you are interested in these topics and themes and are wanting to work against your internal anti-fatness, because I know a lot of us have that. I do. I'm trying to work against it. This is yet another good book. The podcast is incredible. And I have a lot of work to do. We as a society have a lot of work to do, but I recommend this one. So all of these books, I enjoyed all of them. I'm eventually gonna buy all of them, I'm pretty sure. And so if you've had any good nonfiction reads lately, please let me know. I'm wanting to get back in kind of my uh, morbid nonfiction, if you will, ones on like pathology and death science, stuff like that. But I have so many I wanna read, but I have to pace them out so I don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> with them all but uh, leave any recommendations down below or if you've read any of these and have any thoughts you'd love to share i'd love to hear those as well but if you enjoyed this video please give it a like please subscribe check out my description i'll link all of these uh, books i have information uh, about things that are going on in the world and ways you can help links to my social media and ways to support my channel if you'd like but thank you so much for watching this video and i'll see you in my next one bye